Here we go. What could be worse than the Dune Steve Audio Fiction magazine? Nada. Thanks for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction magazine. And now here's your host, Big Anklevich. Jake Louise. And Rish Outfield. It's not that he's evil. He lacks empathy and he goes into a dissociative state and commits atrocities. <laughs> Don't forget, announcer man. Hi everybody, welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. I am Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. And we're here with another story for you today from our triple word score contest. Will it ever stop? Yo, I don't know. Turn off the lights and I'll glow. Really? To the extreme, you rock and mic like a band. <laughs> no. <clears throat> I want to see you glow. That would be rad. Growing up under power lines, I'll do that to you. Yeah, nice. So yeah, we're back with uh, another other installment of our contest. Will it stop? I don't know. Um, there's like 15 stories to get through that we uh, liked enough to decide to publish them. That they liked enough. Well, yeah, they it and we. It was a democracy. I think we made the cutoff line, though. Mm-hmm. We said, here up, wins, here down, loses. Right, except for this story, it was a democracy. <laughs> And can you briefly explain how the game worked? Sure. We had a contest, the Triple Word Story Contest, in which every person who wanted to be a part of it was assigned three random words. We cut out the words on little strips of paper and put them in a hat and drew them out one by one. Today's story, the three words that uh, our author today got were hairpin... Cuisine and Snowman. And uh, yeah, he was able to fashion today's story, which is called What Could Be Worse Than Murray's Chinese Cuisine by Void Monashi. And this was a really fun story, and I think you guys will enjoy the production that has been made of it. It was produced by Pete Nixon. And I think it's his first time doing a, a production of a, of a story for us, so it'll be fun to listen to. He was the one who was institutionalized briefly <laughs> after completing the episode. I think that has been all of our producers, actually, so far. So uh, you, you have to be more specific. Enjoy. Monashi. What Could Be Worse Than Marie's Chinese Cuisine by Void Munashi. A pair of headlights cut through the dark as a 1992 Subaru wagon, light blue under the thick layer of road filth, speeds along the lonely road. The road itself is clear of snow, but grimy walls of the stuff line both sides of the pavement. Oh, come on, Marty. It wasn't that bad. It was that bad, Liza, but I don't know what I should have expected from a place called Murray's Chinese Cuisine. You're just judging it because the owner isn't Asian. That's a little racist, isn't it? I'm judging it because you had the option of having your entree served over rice, chow mein, or french fries. (sighs) That's for the kids. Kids like fries. At least after a meal like that, nothing worse can happen tonight. Not until I get to the bathroom, anyway. (laughs) Liza turns to point a finger in Marty's face. No one told you to order. Hey, hey, keep your hands on the wheel, Marty says, sounding panicked. There could still be ice on the road. Liza puts her hands back on the steering wheel and jerks it a little bit to the right to demonstrate stability. The road's fine. See? It hasn't snowed in a week. It's called black ice. It's called black ice, Liza mocks. You're worse than my grandma. There is silence for a few moments save for the hum of the engine and the tires on the road. Also, I don't think sweet and sour frankfurters is exactly authentic. Marty piles on. You know, I'm glad you're picking next time. It better be fragging fantastic. Liza says bitterly. I was thinking Paraminder Singh's authentic Italian. I hear their Vindaloo deep dish is to die for. Shut up! Liza snaps and reaches over to turn on the radio. She repeatedly stabs the scan button trying to find something to listen to. While she is looking down, 
Liza speeds past a red bordered triangular sign with an arrow on it that is bent over to look kind of like a hairpin, with one of the legs bent at a 45 degree angle halfway down its length. Below the sign is another sign that reads, 15 MPH. Liza, I think you should slow down. I think you should stop talking before I make you walk home. Liza says, stabbing again at the buttons on the radio. No, really, the road. Marty points out the windshield. Do you want to dr- Liza! Liza looks up from the radio to see the road suddenly turning to the right. The car's headlights reflect back off the series of bright yellow signs with black arrows on them pointing to the right. Oosh! Liza starts, jerking the wheel to the right and slamming on the brakes. The Subaru's tires squill on the surface of the road as the car drifts into the oncoming lane. Liza almost has it under control when the car hits a patch of black ice. The car spins, its momentum taking it the rest of the way across the road. The hood of the car hits the grimy snowbank at the edge of the road and launches off of it like a ram. It crashes through one of the bright yellow arrow signs with the sound of splintering wood and shattering headlights that are almost drowned out by the sounds of screaming. After a short flight that would make the Duke boys proud, the Subaru slams down into a field carving a deep furrow into the previously smooth snow. Momentum carries the car forward into and through the cheery looking snowman. When the car finally stops sliding, the grinning severed head of the snowman is sitting on the hood like it is watching Liza and Marty. The engine makes a clinking, rattling noise and sputters a couple of times, then dies, taking the dashboard lights with it. The world around the car goes silent except for the sound of two people breathing heavily. You okay? Asks Liza, looking over at her friend in the darkened car. I'm doing better than your car. Marty groans. Or that snowman. I'll call for help. Liza says and begins searching around for her purse. She finally finds it by her feet and pulls it up onto her lap. Damn it! What's wrong? My phone won't turn on. I think it broke. Liza says. Use yours. Battery went flat at dinner, remember? Crap. Well, let's go back up to the road and wait for another car to come by. After a fair amount of grunting and cursing, the pair realize that the doors are sealed shut by the snow outside. With the electrical system dead, they are also unable to roll down the windows. Eventually, they crawl over the back seats and open the wagon's rear hatch to climb out onto the snow-covered ground. Okay, that's a little weird. Liza says, looking at another snowman standing a short distance from the hood of her car. Who would build snowmen? Out here. Hey, what's that? Marty says, pointing to a flickering glow in the opposite direction of the road. The back of a small building stands a short distance away. Firelight illuminates the windows. Is that a cabin? Liza asks. Maybe they have a phone. Marty suggests. The pair make their way through the snow, past a few dormant trees, and a number of snowmen. The snowmen seem to surround the house like cheerful sentries. Each one has a pair of stick arms and a perfect face made out of what appears to be charcoal briquettes. Some have on hats or scarves, and Liza can see one holding a broom. All of them look like they could have fallen out of a Norman Rockwell painting. I guess someone really likes snowmen. Marty says, looking around and seeing the vaguely human-shaped silhouettes all around him. It's no worse than liking My Little Pony. Liza says. I am not a brony. I only have Doctor Hooves because I like Doctor Who. Uh Uh-huh, you keep telling yourself that. As they round the front of the house, they're greeted by even more snowmen. Just like the ones around the side and back, these are all picture perfect. Liza walks up to the door and knocks. Hello? Liza calls. I'm sorry to bother you, but we had an accident, and we're hoping to use your phone. They can hear movement inside the cabin, and then the sounds of locks being undone. The door opens wide enough for a wild-eyed woman to look out. Do you know what time it is? The woman asks. I'm sorry, but we had an accident. Liza starts. I heard you the first time. The woman cuts her off. Was anyone hurt? Do y'all need an ambulance? A tow truck. Marty says. With a winch. Neither of us is seriously hurt. Someone's just not a great driver. He slits his eyes at Liza as he says the last part. 
And someone else can just walk next time. Shut up! You're making my head hurt! Come in, use the phone, then go away! The woman says, pulling the door open the rest of the way. The inside of the cabin is a large open room with a couple of doors at the back that lead to what is likely the bathroom and maybe a closet. The room has a bed near one of the doors and an old couch facing the fireplace. On the left wall is a small kitchen and the table and chair set that looked like they had been new when Roosevelt was president. Teddy Roosevelt. Phone's in the kitchen! The woman declares. Liza carefully scrapes her feet on the mat before setting foot into the cabin. She carefully makes her way across to where the phone stands on the wall next to a cabinet. She picks up the handset and starts dialing. I notice there's a lot of snowmen around here, Marty says. There are, the woman says proudly. Did you build them all? Yes, they're my friends. Friends? Yes, my friends. They keep me company all winter long. I hate it when they leave in the spring, but I always put their stuff away for them when they come back next year. I see. Well, I'm sorry to inform you that one of your friends was involved in a road accident. Speed Racer over there ran it down in the crash. What? The woman cries. Yeah, it was an accident, but the head survived. I'm sure you... Murderer. The woman hisses under her breath and crosses the room. She reaches up for something mounted above the fireplace, but the light from the fire dazzles Marty, making him unable to see what it is. It's not until the old woman is taking aim that Marty realizes that what she took down from the fireplace is a double-barreled shotgun. Liza! Liza looks over to see what Marty is yelling about, and sees the old woman pointing a gun at her. She lets out a startled shriek and ducks as the sound of twin explosions fill the room. The phone and part of the cabinet it is next to are reduced to splinters. While the wild-eyed woman struggles to reload the shotgun, Liza runs for the door, bounding across the room. She crashes into Marty, who is standing frozen in the doorway, and they both tumble into the snow as she hears the barrels of the woman's shotgun click into place. Liza screams, pulling her friend up. No! Marty moves, half running, half being dragged by Liza as they try and put distance between themselves and the cabin. Thunder sounds again, and the head of a snowman about a foot to Marty's left explodes into a spray of snow and ice. The woman doesn't pursue them. There's another gunshot a few seconds later, but it is farther away from them as they climb up onto the road. There, Liza and Marty stop, hands on knees, trying to catch their breath. Is she following us? Liza gasps. No! Marty pants. No. It looks like she stopped to help the snowman she shot. Marty, I'm sorry about tonight. The dinner, the accident, whatever the hell that just was. Sorry? Marty asks, grinning. This is going to make the best blog post ever. And there I was thinking that nothing worse than lemon chicken over fries could happen tonight. Liza shakes her head. <sighs> you are an idiot. She lets out a big sigh. There was a gas station a few miles back. We should get walking. Slowly, wearily. The pair start to walk along the side of the road, their shoes crunching on stray chunks of mucky frost that have fallen off the snow bank lining the road. Maybe I'll do the ride home as a whole second part. Marty starts talking in a deeper voice that he likes to call his announcer voice. Liza felt so guilty over her poor choice of restaurant that she drove- Ow! Why'd you hit me? I think we should walk in silence for a while. Welcome back, everybody. Hope you enjoyed the story. The cast list was Matt Nixon was our narrator. Heather Nixon played the part of both women in the story. And Todd Flatland played the part of Marty. The editing and producing was done by Pete Nixon. And yeah, so there you go. So this was Pete's first production for us. Mm -hmm. It's been nice to have so many people be willing to do one of these episodes because... Uh, You've seen how long it's taken us to get the first... How many do you, would you guess of the 15 Triple Ward Score Story winners have we ran? I don't half? know. Five. Oh, no. Five? <laughs> really? I don't want to have to explain the rules again. I'm not sure. I think these work out really well as 
first time producer kind of things because we put that word count limit on it they're not long stories so you won't keep going and have to keep editing and editing until your eyes bleed or something like you would have to do with a normal story on our show so uh, that is nice uh, give somebody a chance to cut their teeth before they have to chew the really tough stuff the gristle yeah not on the bones <laughs> That's good. Yes, uh, I don't know if we put out the uh, the offer, but if you would like to follow in the footsteps of Pete Nixon and have a dad who was impeached, just let us know. And uh, I think we still have a couple more episodes that somebody has not yet spoken for, and then there are probably other stories in the future that somebody can produce. Nixon was never impeached. He just resigned. Was he not impeached? Nope. Was Clinton the only? Clinton and Johnson... But not Lyndon B. Johnson. Johnson from like the 1800s were the only two presidents that were impeached. Oh, I, I did not know that. Apparently you knew that, Big. <laughs> I, I, I did not. That is, that's wild stuff. <laughs> All right. Uh, so usually we ask the author to give us three answers to three sprawling questions. Answer me these questions three, we say. We have said that. Uh, we vowed never to say it again. <laughs> Has Void... Is it all right if I call you Void? Oh. Hell no, Rich Alfield. Oh, wow. Uh, give them the address for the hate letters. That's a character <laughs> who has not been in in a while. The, the the three questions went as thus. Do you want me to ask the questions or do you want me to answer the questions? I've always answered and you've always asked. That's so we true. could switch it up if you'd like. <laughs> Uh, yeah, let's switch it up. Okay. I will ask you those questions, and you will be playing the part of Void. Can I do an offensive, stereotypical accent? N- no, you probably better not. All right. People don't like my cowboy voice anyway. <laughs> Was this contest a fun contest for you? Hell no, big anchor fish. Shh. Is writing generally fun to do anyway? How did the rules of this contest make it more or less enjoyable for you? The contest was definitely fun, if challenging. I do generally enjoy writing when I get into the groove. For you've got to prove your love to me. (laughs) Get up on your feet. Yes, step to the beat. This is why you don't have a Parsec Award, Rish. Sorry. I generally enjoy writing when I get into the groove with a story. But when I am struggling to write the bit between the beginning and climax it tends to become less fun. I think I found the rules for this contest a little bit easier to work with than the ones for the last Broken Mirror story event. Can you add in a shattering sound for that? Because I'm too lazy to do it right now. Hell no, Rish Outfield. (laughs) Ching. Thank you. But that may be because I have been submitting stories to a site called Clever Fiction that frequently uses three words as their writing challenge prompts. The thing that I found the most difficult once I had the story written was coming up with a title. I think that took a couple of days. You were given three words at random. How much impact did the three words have on the finished product? How did you decide in what way to use these words? The words completely shaped the story, or stories, as this story was a third attempt. This was not one of those situations where I had a story sitting around that I could shoehorn the words into. Good for him. The hairpin was going to be a hairpin turn from the first time I saw the words, but Snowman and Cuisine both changed their uses a couple of times before I found something that worked with the story and did not feel forced. Okay, now I've got a really important question for you, sir. Okay. Who is your favorite doctor? Tom Baker is easily my favorite. He was the doctor I watched as a little kid on PBS every night after whatever comedy they were running at the time. Good Neighbors, Faulty Towers, etc. He has the scarf, the jelly babies, and canine. What more could you want from a doctor? David Tennant and Patrick Troughton are a close second and third, though. You could want jelly bellies. I like jelly bellies, but not the gross That does not ones. surprise me. You don't like the snot-flavored ones? Yeah, I don't like the Birdie Bots ones for sure, but I don't even like the popcorn-flavored ones or like the jalapeno ones that they had before Birdie Bots ever came along. I'm pretty sure the Birdie Bots Every Flavor Beans were based on Jelly Bellies, 
which then later made Birdie Bot's beans based on the Birdie Bot's from. It's kind of interesting. It's like the whole producers thing where the producers play was based on the producers movie which was then made into a movie based on the play and now coming soon is the play that's based on the second movie no no that part no (laughs) the world isn't that effed up yet (laughs) oh it'll come give it time uh so anyhow uh, the reason i liked this story well there were two reasons i liked the story because of the banter I, I enjoyed sort of the bickering. Now, see, I thought they were a couple, but they're not a couple, are they? There, he is clearly gay, <laughs> and she he only have... has sex with mannequins and snowmen. It turns out, Ugh. but they weren't a couple, right? They were just friends. I'm not sure. They could have been one of those couples that does that, but I think they may have just been friends. Do you think it's possible for a man and a woman to be friends? No. Why not? Well, what I'm saying, and this is not a come on in any way, shape, or form, is that men or women can't be friends because the sex part always gets in the way. Because no man can be friends with a woman that he finds attractive. He always wants to have sex with her. Uh, uh, So you're saying that a man can be friends with a woman he finds unattractive? No. You pretty much want to nail them too. Well, what if they don't want to have sex with you? Doesn't matter, because the sex thing is there already. It's already out there, and so the friendship is ultimately doomed, and that's the end of the story. Good night, folks. (laughs) Okay, so I guess that was a no. (laughs) I I don't know. No, I I, I agree with you. I don't believe so either. Okay, so that was one of the things that I liked, but then the other thing was the snowman thing. Uh, I, it just came out of nowhere. It was just like this whole field <laughs> filled with snowmen. And I was just like, oh, no. You know, I, I, it was one of those things that was so wrong. There's like, there's no way this can go in a good direction. There's no way this can be a benign thing. There's no way we can have a happy ending after finding a field full of snowmen. But they were happy snowmen. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Just they were my... smiling, fun snowmen. They weren't like... Their faces weren't etched in a rictus of screaming terror or anything like that. I, it's just the setting, the idea of a field full of snowmen. Uh, Lon Chaney Sr. was famous for saying, everybody loves a clown, nobody loves a clown at midnight. Yeah, it's that sort of thing. It's like, oh yeah, snowman is a jolly thing. A whole load of snowmen in a f- field. <laughs> Nobody loves five snowmen in a field. I thought it was funny the way that he ended it, you know. I mean, the the shotgun comes out, and you think, okay, this is trouble. And she starts shooting, but she immediately quits shooting. Well, because she injured one of her (laughs) children. (laughs) Which I think is so funny. (laughs) She stopped to help the snowman that she accidentally shot. Uh, That was enjoyable. It was really, really bent, that, that idea, for me at least. I mean, the, the old woman is like, my friend's murderer, or whatever. It's like, oh, geez. <laughs> I saw Kathy Bates playing that one, you know, the right. Annie Wilkes from Misery or whatever answers the door. And she's like, oh, nothing. We don't need anything. Good night. You, you, you have a good night. And they just turn and walk away when she answers the door. Yeah, yeah, it was uh, silly. Well, yeah, I was sure it was going to go in like a really messed up, supernatural way you know with all these snowmen and that they would come to life and or or, then the faces would turn ugly well that kind of too but or also just like the like a medusian kind of thing where but instead of stone statues that you know the the victims have become you know it's like they're eternally snowmen or you know just like they didn't mention that this took place in june (laughs) and there were snowmen (laughs) all over yeah, it did seem like there was going to be something really awful. And you, I expected that was the end of our two wisecracking characters, our two bickering, maybe lovers, maybe friends. Maybe one of them was gay. We don't know. It never came out and spelled it. You can just put your own worldview on these characters. <laughs> Whatever you like. Yeah, see, I prefer to think of them as cousins. But where I come from, that could still be lovers, yes. That is your worldview. It did seem like there was going to be some some bad ending for these people. And I, I actually found it kind of refreshing that there wasn't, that they were able to run away and the woman had to stop and help the poor injured snowman that she'd hit instead. 
You made me chuckle. Made me laugh out loud. L O L. Oh, you take that back. Don't you say that on my show. I did. I lolled. <laughs> Yuck. Come on. You're better than that. I'm going to say at your funeral, we will all pretend that you never said I lolled. <laughs> ever. In fact, that can be part of the eulogy is I never heard the man say I lolled. And then all of a sudden, somebody in the crowd will be like, liar! I have a recording! No, play it. I don't think that's a legitimate recording. <laughs> like, yeah, well, listen. Then somebody stands up and says, liar! I have a recording! It's like, wow, this is getting surreal, you guys. <laughs> Uh, this... I really did actually laugh out loud. That, see, that's the thing that makes me sad about that phrase, L-O-L. Is because it lost it's... all meaning. Yeah. It should be L-A-M, lost all meaning instead. <laughs> because, yeah. It, it, <laughs> it should be L-A-M-E, because yeah. that's what it has become. Okay, there you go. People use it lots, or some people use it a lot. Basically, in place of a smiley face emoticon they put lol all the time like yeah this lol and then this lol it's like no these aren't none of these things are funny that you're even putting this to not even slightly humorous yeah, why it has this replaced means laugh. jk yeah just kidding only now it's lol <laughs> this means laugh out loud it means that you laughed a lot like you didn't just <laughs> you didn't just chuckle you didn't just smile you laughed out loud it, you R O F L M A O. Yeah. D. It's it's S M P. <laughs> and yet his pants are clean. I just I don't it doesn't mean <laughs> what it's used to mean. <laughs> and just like literally no longer means literally. What have we become, my sweetest friend? What you most despise? There so, you go. Has Floyd Munashi sent us a story before? He has sent us a story before. He was a winner of a previous contest that we did called the Broken Mirror Story event in which a child was proclaimed king. Or queen. Wait, sorry, you have to do that. <laughs> I will not say or queen. Dang, you tricked me. But it turns out to be more than just a game. Yeah, there, there we go. I couldn't remember the, the rest of it. But yes, he won that with a story entitled Dax. No, please. Just stop right there. Fair. Oh. Why? Why would we have run a story called that? Ever. <laughs> and it was a pun because oh, fair gosh. had an E on the end of it. As what in is like next? We will run a poem on the show? No, we will never run... A pun titled story or a. What about an untitled story? <laughs> pun titled. That would be an awesome pun title. No, it would not. Stop it. Take it back. <laughs> pun titled self portrait. Get out of there. Somebody's thinking this is clever right now, mistakenly, and they're going to be like, oh, I'm going to write a story called that, and I'm going to submit that to the Dune Steve. Submissions are closed forever. We don't, <laughs> we don't run stories on this show anymore. The worst thing is, it will win. And it will win because we let other people judge the stories with us. Yeah, we need see, to this stop one, that. Today, this episode was the opposite of that. But all the other episodes <laughs> are, were like that. Pun titled. Yes, uh, he wrote that story and uh, we ran it. And I thought it was a pretty good story. That was the one where Dax was like a demon hunter. Was he a rogue demon hunter? I don't think he was a rogue. Okay. Uh, he was He was roguish a little. All right. He went into this town where they were having an affair and then... A child was proclaimed king, not queen. Okay. And it turned out to be more than just a game. Did it? Interestingly now? enough. And uh, yeah, if you'd like to listen to that one, you can. It's back in our archive. I'll even put a link on the show notes for you. I'll leave uh, the E off, though, when you put the link in there, would you? Um, I'd never put an E on the word link. That would be weird. So let's talk about When Harry Met Sally again. <laughs> The guy who did the voice of the boyfriend amused me with his his little reference to the the restaurant that was equally as disappointing as uh, Murray's Chinese Murray's cuisine. Chinese cuisine. Um, he had good timing on that line. There was just something droll about the way he said it. Yeah, he 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 was pretty good. The guy that was the voice of the. Uh... The banter back and forth really flowed well together. Those two did a great job, I thought, with their uh, 
witty retorts. Yeah, I wonder, uh, usually I complain that these stories are too short, but I wonder if this story would have been any better with a little bit more. Uh, it, it, it felt pretty well structured, pretty tight. Uh, you know, there was a lot of dialogue, but it was always funny. And then the accident happens before it could run its welcome out. And then the end happens before their second bit of dialogue can, can run out. I, I, I don't know. He said this was the third story he wrote using those same three words. That's unusual, I think. Or maybe not. But I wonder. I mean, I, I, I do that. But I wonder if other people didn't send us their first attempt, but tried again and again. I, I'd like to read those other two stories and see if they're any good. I know that I sent my first attempt. That's pretty much the only attempt that I made at writing any story Ever? the entire year. Yeah. But that's okay, because uh, David Lee Dukes uh, says that you're supposed to just submit your story as soon as it's done. <laughs> you want his real name? Dean Wesley Dean Smith. Wesley Smith. See, I knew, just like all, so all, assassins. all assassins, he had three names. But yeah, he, he doesn't believe in uh, endlessly rewriting or fiddling with things. And uh, there's probably a bit of good advice in there. Yeah, there's a, a little bit to that. I think uh, some people just need to have confidence in themselves and they just need to go for it. Other people, that's not their problem and they need to work on other things. But I think that is one of the big problems that many writers have as they will continually... And endlessly fiddle with and add to or subtract from and then add back more to and subtract more from their story until it's been messed with so much that it's not very good. And See, yeah, that part I don't know if I agree with or not. Because One thing that he always says that I totally disagree with is he says, if you rewrite a story, it will take anything personal and your personal voice out of the story. Couldn't disagree more. It's light at night, basically. But that's just because when I rewrite, you know, it's like, oh, I could expand on this. Or, oh, hey, here's a funnier line that I could have put there. And you approach it with a different mindset once you've written the story than actually just, oh, I got to get it out on paper. I got to create these words from my mind where they're just floating images inside my head. But maybe his rewrites are totally different. He's just like, oh, well, the rhyme scheme has to be different and it has to have a certain... <laughs> stanza to each sentence and maybe that does take away all of your personality yeah i don't know he just says that when you write you're using your more creative voice but when you're editing you're using your critical voice which is not creative and takes things away it might be different no see i think most people aren't usually adding and adding and adding and adding and adding to their stories like you do how many addings when you rewrite you're like, hmm, let's see. The story's only 11,000 words long. I should add a scene or two here because it seems like it's missing more scenes. I mean, that's what's missing, really. And so I'm going to put some more in. Yeah, that story that you and I wrote was like a novelette. Now it's a novella. <laughs> only, a, only a few more passes and we'll have a novel. We'll be ready to go. We could say we wrote our first novel. You know what? We need a scene where these two sub characters meet for the first time <laughs> well no let's do a whole book about that <laughs> that would be what orson scott card would do <laughs> that's true hey let's do a whole book about when ender meets his computer for the first time good idea that'll sell it, uh, it <laughs> sells better than the alvin maker stuff though right <laughs> true enough but but you and i uh, tend to share the opinion that Making it longer it makes it better. Right? Yeah, to a certain degree it does, I think. It's it's nice to have more character development and stuff like that. I mean, it depends on what you add, really. Just making it longer doesn't always make it better. But, you know, giving your story more worthwhile detail and character and stuff like that does make it better. If you're like, oh, we need to strip out this... It's like taking an attractive woman and it's like, oh, now let's make her too thin. Let's get rid of all these pleasant curves. But wait, why, Just why would you do that? You wouldn't. See, that's what I'm saying. But that's what a lot of people do with stories. They'll write a story and they're like, hmm, well, it's 5,000 words. Stories are better if they're 3,000 words. So I'm going to take out 2,000 words. Wait, but who is this liar that says stories are better at 3,000 words? seems to be kind of a prevailing opinion that 
less is more. And that's something that I've never understood because majority of stories are published just online now. It's not like you're going to run out of pixels. I mean, I can understand it in the old days when they were publishing them on paper. And they're like, damn, we can't afford all this paper. It's killing us to pay all this money, these giant books worth, you know? Let's, let's make these things shorter. I can understand that. Well, but I don't know if you heard, but there was a scientific study done. And it turns out more is more. Yeah, I yeah, see. I, just, I, I, I think I saw that same study. Well, they proved it with beakers. Yeah. And measuring spoons. <laughs> more, more turned out to be, in the end, more rather than less being that. It makes me sad sometimes to see that, you know, where you're just like, yeah, well, there's this fat that we just need to trim. No, the fat is what makes it curvaceous. Um,. <laughs> Which is good, curvaceous. Uh, but you'll see that in Hollywood, too, where there's a, a, a movie that the studio is not confident is going to do well. And so the first solution is, let's make it shorter. Uh, and it's, it's just crazy, though, but that's that's what they'll do if they're just like, wow, I, I, Green Lantern did not test well. Let's cut 25 minutes out of it. And their thinking is, well, at least it'll show more times during the day that way, and we'll get more money from it. <laughs> okay. But, yeah, it's just like, well, we got to cut out all the character development, and any scene where people are talking, that we got to we got to get out because then the movie will be better. How, how did these people get these jobs? Where, where? How can you have worked in the movie business that long and think that cutting out the talking makes a movie better? It's the prevailing opinion, just like it is with stories, which uh, is sad sometimes because you'll lose good things that way. Somebody will write a story with lots of stuff like that, and then they'll be like, oh, this is unnecessary. We don't need to know that this character does this and that this is what they like. They're, just, they're not really moving forward towards the climax here, so let's get rid of it. I don't know that that's necessarily a good thing. There's lots and lots of books and stories out there that are really long. And uh -huh. people like them. Take, for example, the Game of Thrones series. Those are big, fat, gigantic, thick books. And that's probably one of the main reasons why people like them. Because they're big, fat, thick, detailed... Well, the author writes enough about each one of these characters that those characters come alive. You feel like you know them. Right. You know their motivations and their fears and their desires. Instead of them all being the same character but with a different name, these guys are all well-rounded characters with depth and personality to them. And I don't know, maybe you can do that in a super short book. But with that many characters, I just don't imagine how that could happen. And, and you know, the HBO series... They take 10 hours to tell the story of one of these books. That's way stronger than if each book had been a three-hour movie. Right. And even with the 10-hour extravaganzas that they do, there's still a lot that they have to leave out. True. They true. still aren't doing everything. They still have to collapse and condense and combine characters. Two characters become one character and so on. They still have to do that. But I guess, I don't know, I mean, we have complained at other times, like Stephen King, his stuff gets bloated, and you've talked about how he needs an editor now, he's he's too well established and and respected, and so his editors just won't tell him to cut this and cut that and cut the other thing. What's the difference, do you think? Why is Stephen King bloated, George R. R. Martin is rich and detailed? Well, you have a, a George R. R. Martin book right there on the shelf, uh -huh. and you put it next to a King book, and there's your difference. Like, put Insomnia, which is so overblown, next to A Feast for Crows, and it's, it's clear which one is super, super long. Uh, there were the two versions of The Stand, and it, as wonderful as the, the 70s version of The Stand was, I, the 90s one suddenly, characters that were just you know, incidental characters came alive. And now granted, you know, that's stuff that they cut out for that reason you mentioned a while ago. Oh, nobody's going to be able to buy a book that's a thousand pages long. And think of all the trees and... Uh, Look you know. at the bones! Exactly, yes. 
I don't know. Uh, my thought with King not having an editor is, I mean, he, he just writes f- from the hip. You know, he doesn't know where things are going. He's a and, pantser. And sometimes it feels like he doesn't know where he's going. And, and an editor is somebody who's like, oh, hey, Steve, somewhere around page 300, I feel like you sort of got off track and you forgot where you were supposed to be heading with that. You know, you think we could maybe lose some of what's between page 300 and 350. I don't think that there's somebody that tells him that anymore. I, and, and you know, I could be wrong. I've heard lots of people say that his recent stuff is way better than his stuff from the 70s, which is so untrue. Again, <laughs> it's like saying it's bright at night instead of dark. But so, you know, that's just opinion. If somebody read something that he read, wrote recently and said, you know, that was way better than any of that crap that he wrote, like Firestarter or It or Salem's Lot or, you know, I, I'd be like, well, OK, that's how you feel then I guess I, I, I shouldn't argue with that. But you will. Do you think it's just a trait of pantsers, which is the term that people have come up with for somebody who writes by the seat of their pants, they don't have an outline ahead of them, versus planners, which are those who sit down and plan everything out ahead of time and stuff, that with a planner, more is more, but with a pantser, perhaps less is more, because they're just blowing smoke out their ass half the time and sometimes they're lost that's got to be it i you look at the that last harry potter book and oh i've heard so many people complain about how long it is that book is not long there's so little wasted space in that final harry potter book and almost all of it is like payoff of stuff that's been set up stuff that was ingeniously hinted at through earlier books throw away crap from the second book with the basilisk and stuff like that that comes back as though it was all part of a plan, as though it was all meant to be, as though these things really happened and she's just recounting actual history. And that, to me, is the difference between a pantser and a planner. And somebody else would be like, "Eh, no book should be over 400 pages long. (laughs) He's still alive! But just the difference between the seventh Harry Potter book and the seventh Dark Tower book, I hate to keep using this, are night and day. What? What? You mean like it's light at night? Wait, that's something else. Do you think that perhaps Stephen King may have changed his technique as his life progressed? Because you have told me the story of The Dark Tower and how at some point Stephen King was on like a road trip going around signing books and crap and his notebook with all his notes for The Dark Tower in it got lost somewhere. And from there on, you can tell that he's just kind of making the crap up as he went along. Is that a true story or an apocryphal story? That may be an apocryphal story. I mean, I have heard him say that he did a a, a tour of the U.S. in 1994 when The Stand was being made as a movie. And he lost this big notebook that he'd carried around since college that had a bunch of notes in it or or story ideas or, or, or whatever you want to call it. But I don't know that, that that it was all that significant, or if because to me the 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 mark of delineation on the Dark Tower is his car accident. The books before and the books after are so very 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 different, and as part of his mindset of nearly dying and seeing his life flash before his eyes and hearing the fans bitch and moan that they would have been robbed of the last Dark Tower books had Stephen King died. And that's what was important to him, not the life of this person that they cared about. That influenced him to just sit down and write it all at one sitting. And of course, it wasn't one sitting, but you know what I mean. Well, he was injured and he couldn't get up, so it may have been one sitting. (laughs) There you go. He'd hurt his leg. Those, Those last three books are not what the first four books were. I mean, I have heard him say recently that he'd like to go back and there's some things that he'd like to change, especially from those later books where he was just... You know, he was really pantsing it he was, on those last three books. He was in a hurry. But, that, again, just everybody has an opinion, and that's just mine. The, there's a part in the fourth book where we find out what happened to Roland's mother, and King wrote that when he was a freshman in college. That was something that he always knew happened in the backstory, and he always knew one day he would get to tell that. And... That's the sort of thing I was talking about so with, that's with Harry more, Potter. Yeah, that's much she more. She knew what was going to happen 
on the platform with all of them as adults before she ever, ever got to it. You know what I mean? Books before she ever got to it. Right. And that guided her, that gave her, if not like a a narrow creativity-free structure, it at least gave her a a couple of obstacles on each side of the road that tell her, okay, you're going too far. You're meandering from the path. And there's so much meandering in those last three Dark Tower books. And, And I feel like I'm bagging on the man. But I guess it sounds like he's at least somewhat changed his style because if he's written the scene when you find out about what happened to Roland's mother 30 years earlier, then he's planned these things, not so much pants to them. And maybe that was in that notebook that got lost yeah, during could... the motorcycle trip. I, I just there, there was a book that he wrote called Under the Dome just a couple of years ago. And as I was reading it, I was like, I know you. This is Stephen King from the 1970s. Where have you been all these years? And then you, when you reach the end of the book, he's got a little author's note. And he's like, I started this in like 1971 when I was uh, just getting out of school or whatever, when I was t- still teaching and Carrie had not yet been published. And I put it away because I didn't know how to end it or I, it was too big for me and all that. And it's just like that came as no surprise at all. That felt like him. And so I think he has changed the way that he writes or or maybe just he's got too many ideas and not enough time to tell them. And so he tries to cram them all in and it goes crazy, whereas he used to have much sharper vision. And it's like, I know where I'm going and I'm going to write until I get to that point. I don't know. I mean, everybody writes in a different way. I just I can't just spitball it and write not knowing where I'm going to go. Because disaster strikes and disaster equals writer's block or disaster equals apathy, which is worse than writer's block. Disaster equals not finishing the story. It does. Which is what generally happens to you if you don't plan ahead. And that doesn't necessarily apply to you. You're not exactly that same way. You can formulate a story in your mind and shape it and mold it. And a month later, it's still shaping and molding in your head. You don't lose it. And that's that's inspiring to me, but I can't do that. That's true, but I still have to have it planned out before I start writing. I'm also not a pantser. Uh, I don't even wear pants, for that matter. I I just sometimes people call me the bottomless clown, <laughs> but no one likes a clown at midnight. So well, it's especially a bottomless. Clown. <laughs> that's right. No one likes a bottomless clown at noon. Frankly, it's really yeah. But anyways, yeah, I, I, I'm not a pantser because, uh, yeah, I just can't do it. I, I need to know where I'm going. And there's sometimes I've written stories where I don't really know where I'm going and I force some kind of an ending onto the story and usually they turn out to be pretty crappy. I, the last story that I wrote was that way. I had an idea and I started going with it, basically pantsing this story. And by the time I was done, I was just like, okay, I guess this is what I'm going to do. And then I did it, and I was like, boy, does that suck. And I was not pleased with the way it turned out. And I've talked about it on here before. There, the story, uh, Battle of the Ideas, that we did a couple months ago, many months ago, I guess now, that was the story I probably did my best pre-plan of. I really worked on that one before I ever started writing. And I thought... I think it turned out really well because of it, as opposed to what it might have been otherwise. Did it make it easier to write the story, having planned it that much, when it, it came time to actually write? It did, yeah. I knew where I was going, and I, I knew what I was doing in the scenes that I had. And uh, sometimes I even added a few scenes that I didn't have before because of the planning that I'd done prior to that. And uh, yeah, I, I think it turned out better than it would have if I had just tried to go for it. Probably significantly better, to tell you the truth. And it was an enjoyable experience because of it, I think, too. It's something that I've tried to replicate, but I've been too lazy to actually write a good full-on story since then. I have written a couple of really short things, but nothing of the of that same size and complexity since, so I need to bear down... <laughs> and actually do something like that again really put that to the test well we have once again devolved into a conversation about writing 
That's inevitable with us, isn't it? Pretty much. It'll happen at least every two or three episodes. I don't see any way around that. I mean, we could just do a podcast about writing every week. I would end up saying the same damn thing over and over again, and you'd get so sick of hearing me talk about writing a story in, in high school where I, I knew that the punchline would be, how was the baby? Delicious. And I had to create a story leading up to that punchline, and that's how I realized, okay, I always, I always need to know where the story is going. But luckily, we don't do a podcast just about writing, so you will never hear that story. That's right. Here and there, we diverge onto a tangent about writing. But the show itself isn't about... We'll always talk about, you know, superhero movies and what the story that we actually aired was about. <laughs> Sometimes precious little, but there's always a little bit about that. And now it's time to talk about something completely different. Uh, before we go, we have a uh, special message from a very special guest star. Thank you, ankle bitch. Uh, but, uh, Incredible Hulk here. It's still a couple of years before Hulk come back in Avengers 2, doing Hulk's best to wipe off smarmy expression from James Spader's face. But Hulk here now to talk about serious topical issue. Childhood immunizations. Uh, uh Hulk? Now, me not a scientist. But Hulk know it very important for children to receive immunizations. Actually, in a way, Hulk is a scientist, in as much as Puny Banner is physicist, which Hulk think is related to scientist. Me not sure how that works. But what Hulk is sure of is that there are no correlations between autism and vaccinations. It dangerous thing to not give vaccines for what called herd immunity, which really mean that if enough people are resistant, a disease won't be able to spread and potentially infect enough people. Herd immunity even help those who not get vaccinated because there are far fewer potential carriers wandering around. Uh, Hulk, you, uh... Hulk is strongest one there is, but children not so tough. Kids are the ones who are really hurt by not having vaccines. They can die from things that even weakling scientists like Richards and Stark can survive. So if you have a lack of herd immunity, you have a lot more young deaths. Right, right, Hulk. We, uh, of course, at the Dune Steve, are not advocating that people immunize their children, of course. You know, we try to stay out of such... Outfield will shut up and let Hulk finish. Okay. Hulk not capable of fear, but people sometimes very afraid of vaccines because they think you're getting a little version of the disease. But this not how it works. You simply teaching your system to build an immunity. Scientists can easily engineer dead pathogens, or just use dead ones, or engineer fake pathogens that have same little qualities to teach your immune system. Being exposed to dead bug allows your body to learn how to counteract it without the germ being alive to do any of tasks that it does to harm you. Once your body develops an immune response, it becomes a regularly produced defense, even when disease is gone. This why you only get chicken pox once. Did you ever get the chicken pox, Hall? That why autoimmune diseases are so dangerous, cause that your body fighting itself. Like time when Superman and Clark Kent fight in Junkyard in movie with Richard Pryor in it for some reason. That one of the scariest things you can get. Okay, Hulk done now. Uh, thank you, Hulk. That was very informative. No problem, small Anklevich. Hulk glad to. But he was just supposed to help us ask for donations. Are you going to tell him that he made a mistake? Good point. Uh, thanks, Hulk. No problem. Hulk, see you again in 2015 when Avengers Ultron's birthday comes out. Uh, are you sure that's the title? Pretty sure. Well, last I read, it was... No, sorry. It Avengers Day of Ultron. Uh, age. Age? Hulk 50. 
No, he means age of Ultron. That not relevant. Ultron gets created in movie. Technically, he negative one right now. No, the, the title's Age of Ultron. Hulk not know Ultron's age. Hulk not care. Do you care? No. Nope. Uh, not at all. <clears throat> all right, we've uh, gone on for a while again. Yes, isn't it amazing how long we can talk about nothing? <laughs> not that this story was nothing. I, I liked this story a lot. I was a champion of this story, and I uh, stand by it. That's right. Yeah, it was really good and a really fun story. I really enjoyed the banter and just, just how it all went. And like you said, I think it may have even been at the correct length. We couldn't really have stretched it much more. It's not one of those stories where, hey, I mean, maybe you would have added scenes to it because that's just you and it's what you do. But I don't know that that would have actually made it better. I think we actually had the whole story. Which some of the stories we've had where we're like, yeah, you know, this really kind of lit my imagination. I wanted a lot more to it. And there wasn't quite enough. I I think this one was good. We had the fun characters and they got in a kooky little adventure. And then they were going to go home and write their blog about it. (laughs) That's right. And (laughs) I was going to do a two-part blog because the adventure is only halfway through. And uh, yeah, I I thought it was really enjoyable and it was probably just right. Maybe it was written by a planner and not a pantser, and so it went where it was supposed to go. I don't know how Void writes stories, so it'd be interesting. He can get on the comments, perhaps, and uh, and talk about that on the forum. We'll put a link to that, too. Yeah, in the future, if we ever do this contest again, instead of that inane third question, I can ask people, of, would this story have been better with an extra thousand words? Yeah, that might be fun. Anyhow, I have been Rish Outfield. Really? I have. I just, but I'm saying goodbye. I'm oh, putting oh. the persona away. Oh, okay. I have been Rish Outfield. And I'm going to be Al Garvan Kluth from now on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And I've been Big Anklevich. And from here on out, I will be Avril Levine. Oh. Thanks for listening, folks. Butt plug <laughs> something Avril Levine. <laughs> what was the third one? Second one. I can tell you in one second. You can't. Next week on a very special episode of Blossom. One shall stand. (laughs) One shall fart. You always fart. Pencil sharpener. Ciao. Good boy. The Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you can share the Doonstief with anyone you'd like, but you can't sell or change the files. Take two. Welcome back, everybody. Hope you enjoyed the story. The cast list was... Meh. Insert cast list here. And yeah, so there you go. Who is your favorite doctor? Tom Baker is easily my favorite. <laughs> Tom he just downshifted into uh, English spelling because he's talking about Doctor Who, yeah, I think. I think so. Thank you, ankle bitch. How does Hulk talk? Uh, I think it was like that, and then you lower his pitch okay. down further, right? Hey, I noticed a couple of times here Hulk sounds smarter than normal. He's not supposed to. Is he supposed to sound smarter because he's talking all this vaccination stuff, or should it still be his usual thing where he's like, I, it, a couple yeah. of years before Hulk come back in it, Avengers It was two. really hard because eventually he has to sound like he knows what he's talking about because I'm quoting Brian Lincoln. And, but how do you do that unless he uses big words that Hulk would use? He could use the big words. I think the thing that would make it funny is that he still uses the big words, but the it's the joining words that need to drop, you know? Okay. Like, it couple of years before Hulk come back in Avengers 2. Hulk yeah, doing well, best wipe off smarmy expression. To talk about serious topical issue. Childhood immunizations. Wait, how do you say that word? Immunizations. Which Hulk think is related to scientists. Me not sure how that works. I sound like Cookie Monster. Is that <laughs> no, okay? you don't. Okay.
kids are the ones who are really hurt by not having vaccines. <laughs> this is word for word, dude. I mean it. Ryan just you know, got on his soapbox. <laughs> They can die from things. Wait, that... do, do the kids are the ones you were kind of laughing oh. through it? Outfield will shut up and let Hulk finish. That's word for word, too. Brian said that. Yes. <laughs> let, let me tell you of, of the days, days of the, the Dunes Thief Audio Fiction Magazine. Behold your hosts, the Dread Big Anglovich and the infamous Rich Outfield. 